um, and it has always been forward looking and we are going to go back to the future to the year 1986. And in 1986 um, there was a doctorate written in Leuven and this was inside the, um, one of the proposed uh, devices in the doctorate. And um, so this is uh, my post professor, Professor Robert Goos. Um, he published on that idea of having a capsule and over the years it has um, evolved. Uh, all the technologies in the smartphone are now incorporated in this. You have uh, microchips for pressure and you have uh, inductive wireless powering and communication, electromagnetic uh, wave, basically. <coughs> so, once we had it to work and we had enough uh, samples, uh, we wanted to show, we wanted to compare in vitro how does this compare with uh, the techniques that we have in the lab or uh, in the clinic. So we use this, I think Jan knows this very well, we didn't even made this. We made a water column and then connected it to the device that we had, we call it the pill, is here inside and we put it on the same level as the uh, as zero. And then I created the pressure gradients using the, the column and this is a water uh, a fluid filled transducer, technically speaking, and they look very nice, very nicely calibrated, very small differences. Now we look at air charge catheters. Um, here you see when I was filling it, um, because we could not use the same nice gradients, so I had a, um, a column of water where, where I filled it. And we saw that the increase was not uh, similarly measured with the both, both methods. But um, the peaks, they look slightly similar. In general, I'll take it as the same. <clears throat> so, and then we looked at our in vivo data. We had um, small peaks, mini peaks, they're quite big actually. Um, we tied this um, air charge catheter with uh, the with our pill, and then we have these mini pigs awake, voiding just like um, awake humans, and then we saw everything was alright except that the peaks was higher. So, and then we tried to submit this um, to a journal, um, and then this was another observation that we let the animal void multiple times, and um, this is not uh, interesting for daily urodynamics, but like, uh, for ambulatory urodynamics. Um, then there is some data that the air charge catheter has some drift at one and two hours. And the second thing is that after two voids, uh, the baseline and the performance or the sensitivity uh, started to change. So, <clears throat> where do these differences come from? One, of course, uh, why the, the water catheters is always it said that you can uh, move the transducers and always set the zero point. This is all the problem that we are always using a relative pressure relative to atmospheric pressure while, of course, um, we can always calibrate this um, beforehand to an absolute uh, number, 700 millibars, and then use absolute pressures. Although this is not practical with the, with the, cat uh, the transducers and catheters that we currently have. So the zero point will always have some variation and it is easier to adjust in um, water catheters. For the air charge catheters, um, I put here well, this is the principle from we know from ICS, zero to atmosphere, and the instructions of the air, the T dogs, they say insert the catheter, zero the equipment, and then um, close the system to prevent uh, the compressibility of air. Now, from this point on, this is um, data published by others, and um, this may be an over estimation of the performance. Why? Because um, this manner of uh, calculating the pressure was proposed by Andrew Gammy uh, from the Bristol group, of course. They said that um, any analysis of these pressures, they should follow um, the principles of the ICS, where any deviation from the standard zero and reference level should be taken into account. So, um, he published 
this article comparing uh, water catheters and um, uh, water and air charge catheters, where he said that um, the pressures, we take the initial pressure when we inserted the air charge catheter, and then the changes of pressure is calculated to correct for that. So it's a little bit different than what is done in clinical practice, or should have been done in clinical practice. However, um, the results may, uh, may be close to what uh, some centers are doing. Well, that, uh, of course, in Leuven, what we do is insert everything, and then when inside, after the charge, and then zero. Which uh, probably is uh, something that a big no-no um, in the ICS or the Bristol courses. So, <clears throat> now I switch to another paper, because this is the better one. This is the one proposed by, uh, done by Amori. So, they have um, 50 patients, women, undergoing urodynamics and inserted both um, catheters, uh, both an air charge catheter and a, a water catheter. And then they first looked at resting pressures. The averages look very nice, but once we go to um, the so-called plant Altman uh, plot, where in the x-axis we have uh, the average of both methods as an approximation of the true value of pressure. And then here, um, this is the difference. And what we see here is that individual measurements, they can have some difference. And these differences, the 95% range of confidence is um, quite large. So individual values, they can vary up to 10 centimeters of water at resting. So that is the zero point, that is one cause of the difference. And then now, this part may be a bit uh, uh, more technical, um, where we talk about the signal frequency characteristics, how a certain signal is picked up by a water catheter or by the electron. So, um, signals, imagine this can be something like DNA, something like protein, it can have, um, that the signal can be broken down into components of various frequencies. And um, so, <clears throat> here you see that the signal, that signal, we can say that this has a low frequency component here, of 1 hertz, and this also has a high frequency component of 10 hertz. Um, this has to do with how these signals are picked up or recorded by um, water or by air. So, <clears throat> I took this graph, this is totally not ladder data, these are plural pressures, but they, they illustrate the effect quite nicely. That, let's say this is the true signal, uh, um, that we have two <coughs> peaks and then it goes down. If we put it into a system that is um, not very sensitive to high frequency changes, or so-called overdamp in engineering terms, and then you will have just one peak each. Or, when we go to the other side, to an underdamp, like a water catheter, then they, they will exaggerate these peaks. Now, this is um, in vitro data, so they created uh, a pressure from a pressure decrease, which looks like this, from their original signal, and then when it's measured by a water catheter, you see that um, there is a there's an exaggeration of this change. But however, this is very zoomed in. This is 0.5 seconds, and in the air charge catheter, this goes uh, a bit smoother, and the, the notch is not seen. <clears throat> the same uh, the same experiment or same data in another uh, manner. Where here we see that the x axis is now frequency. Um, when we have a low frequency going up to a high frequency and with the same amplitude, when we put it, measure it with a water catheter, um, there, is some, there is amplification until a certain point and then it becomes um, uh, compressed. However, oh, sorry, it's called attenuated. And what, however, this data was made until 50 hertz. What is important for aerodynamic um, uh, dynamic equipment, as stated in the ICS standards, is that we need to have a minimum bandwidth of 3 hertz. And this is approximately where the 50% attenuation is of the air charge capital. 
Why are we hurts? Because the cuffs mainly they are uh, they go up more than three hertz. However, the largest component of the power that's how it is um, described in the technical uh, standards that the largest uh, portion of the power is under three hertz. But well, I think that this part explains slightly which kinds of signals are picked up differently by air charge catheters and by water catheters. This is the most technical part. After this, uh, we were going to talk more about patient data. So, <clears throat> now going back, this is data presented by a clinical center funded by WE. Mm -hmm. First, they look at cuffs, which is high frequency, and um, as expected, high frequency is picked up less uh, similarly between the both techniques, so we have to see more scatter. And when we look at pulse alpha, uh, with the same range of uh, pressures, they look more linear. Okay. So, the final question, of course, does it matter? Is there a difference? In these 50 patients, um, with some selection probably, uh, only one does not have, well, only in one patient they could not find the dynamic abnormality to explain frequency urgency. All others was urinary diagnosis which matched their working or clinical diagnosis. So, <clears throat> now going back to the earlier paper by Andrew Gami, um, they recruited 62 women and then they had them uh, to undergo uh, urodynamics with both captures. They recruited 62 patients and then uh, they applied a very strict uh, so-called quality control criteria. They, with these quality control criteria, they found problems in four, well, 24 in the air charge catheter vesicle line, um, 16 in the abdominal line, in the water uh, catheter, they found 18 and 17, and then they ended up less than half of the patients that they recruited was, uh, was included in their analysis. So they started with um, changes in position, supine, sitting, standing. The means are all uh, relatively small. However, then they, will, they say that there is significant difference between um, measurement by air filled or water catheters. Um, all is statistically different. However, I, in method comparison studies, of course, we tend to look at the bland Altman plot to know how large are actually the differences in individual measurements when measured using two different uh, methods. So here, um, in the x-axis, it is again the average value or um, an approximation of the true uh, pressure of the bladder. And then um, in the y-axis is bladder pressure, uh, sorry, difference in pressure. And then here we see uh, bladder pressure at 100, 200, 300, and systematic capacity. What I would, what is nice to see is that um, even at the larger values, then there is actually no trend of a larger difference between the methods. And we see here that the difference, uh, or the limits of the agreement, to say it, the spread is between negative 10 and 8 uh, centimeters of water, meaning that we uh, measure using uh, using water catheters or air charge catheters. There can be a difference in, yeah, I will say, I will call it the value of bladder pressure at very likely it's five, between five to ten centimeters of water. At the boiling phase, then we, we see, of course, <laughs> higher pressures. Um, however, again, at the higher pressures, there is sometimes that they uh, differ large, they have larger differences. However, um, the the large, the large, the more more of the plots, they they all fall more in the middle. So, what I take away from this is that both the air charge catheter and more likely the air charge catheter, from observations that if we first insert it and then we charge it, it does, even though that uh, we say it's zero to atmosphere, it will start with uh, perhaps a random, 
starting value. And that random starting value is the one that we corrected already you, um, at the beginning. However, that still shows that we have a large spread. We need something else in addition to that value. So, at some point, uh, in one of the ICI research uh, meetings, they proposed steps how to validate a new eurodynamic um, technique. So first, say, start with a homogeneous set of patients, perform tests without artifacts, and then look at differences in healthy volunteers, quantitative differences, define a parameter, and identify a couple of values. At this point is where I think we have uh, the problem since air charge catheters do not um, when analyzed in this manner, they don't always give the same absolute value. And I think um, in practice is that more this change from the previous baseline is intuitively assessed in uh, interpreting neurodynamics. So when do we use these numbers and how do we use these numbers in systometry? We look at um, overactivity or overactive contractions. Um, compliance, uh, at which volumes uh, certain symptoms occur, these do not need cutoff uh, values. Urethral pleasures, yes, maybe some cutoff values, however, in interpretation, we look at how uh, the increase, of course, also. At pressure flow study, this is where, when using nomograms, these are very, very sensitive in these differences, and then um, patients can be classified, the, the classification of obstruction or non-obstruction then may change. So, this is my last slide, of course, yes, there is a difference, but does the difference matter? It really, it does really matter in the way that it is currently um, prescribed in the ICS good practices, however, can it be done differently? 